four eagles take flight, a new low for the crows and why the hawks win could hurt them. All that and more coming up on the round so far. Kane Corns, welcome to you. Oh, great to have you on board, Nat. Now, what a game it was tonight. Let's start there. We started off the stadium in Perth because this was a finals-like game in front of crowds. Fancy that. And Geelong were terrific in the first half, I thought. I thought their defence held up really well. They were solid down back despite some uh, a lot of entries coming through from the Eagles. This was a contentious moment. They went up to the score review. Simpson's goal counted, even though it looked to appear to come off the knee. And a few mistakes from Geelong led to these opportunities from the Eagles. This one here from Cripps, some said he played on and stepped off his line. I'm not so sure. That would have taken a brave umpire to do this, but Guthrie got up high as well, Nat. He did indeed, and then he just didn't see Liam Duggan coming, and that was a really crucial moment for the Cats because they had some momentum there in that game. They did, and they, and they had some opportunities, Geelong. We're seeing, seeing them here. They just couldn't capitalise. In the end, We'll get to it, but it was, it was led by the Eagles midfield, who were just too good, led by their captain. Uh, sorry, not their captain, like Ruckman, Nick Nat Nui and Josh Kennedy for his performance again, we'll get to also. But too many senior players in the end, particularly the midfield, I thought from the Eagles stood up and got it done and, and came from a three-quarter uh, three time deficit to kick seven out of the last nine goals in the game and finish off what was a terrific game of footy. Yeah, they came storming home. Tim Kelly against his old side, Geelong, was excellent as well. But the Saturday star has to be the one and only Josh Kennedy because he really kicked that sealer and he was getting some brilliant delivery there, not only from Tim Kelly, but some silver service from Nick Natanui as well. I think you're right about that. I think there's no um, surprise that his last two weeks has been significant on the back of this. I mean, the service coming from Nat Nui, that was just terrific. Not the role that Kennedy's usually played the Rover, but connection was great. And 11 goals in the last two weeks, 32 years of age. He's actually spoken about his footy mortality a little bit this year, whether he will go on or not. Well, clearly, he's got a lot of footy left in him. He, he's leading the Coleman medal and, and on the back of the performance tonight. So three goals in the last quarter when the game was on the line. It was a big performance from the Premiership star and what a recruit he's been all those years ago, 2007, when he crossed from Carlton uh, to West Coast as part of that Chris Judd deal. 22 goals for the season. Move over Tom Papley. He's on 20 goals. So the Smalls making way for the Talls at this point. Now, you mentioned Nick Natanui and he was just immense. Uh, just the nine touches, but boy, did he make them count. Bit of talk about who's the most watchable player in the game. Uh, Toby Green's been mentioned, Tom Papley, certainly Dustin Martin in the mix. Hard to go past this guy, though, for, for that reason there. I mean, how unique is he as a player? I mean, he does things that other players just can't do. And that there to Kennedy was, was extraordinary. And the service he's giving his midfielders the last two weeks in particular. So... Beat Brody Grundy convincingly last week and now took it to the lesser lights of Geelong in the ruck. But it's this sort of stuff that just gives his teammates such a boost. And he's had a horror run. And the resilience that he's shown on the back of the knee injuries that he's had and, um, and in the grand final that he missed and then to come in and do this has been terrific. And he looks more confident with every game he's played this year. Yeah, it certainly is a privilege to be able to sit back and watch him play. Now, from the top of the table to the cellar dwellers, and it was the Brews snapping a six-game losing streak with a 69-point thrashing of Adelaide, who are still winless, Kane. And they have some serious issues, and we'll start with their complete lack of pressure. You look at that, Matt. Like, they're kicking the ball up the middle of the ground. Now, the modern football is to put pressure, frontal pressure on the player with the ball carrier. Where, where's the frontal pressure coming here from Adelaide, and new coach Matthew Nix said all pre-season they worked on their defensive action and been hard to play against. I haven't seen that at all. So for the 17th ranked team that had lost six in a row to keep the highest score of the year says pretty much all you need to know about how bad Adelaide are. And it's probably the worst team we've seen in the competition since the Gold Coast entered and GWS entered it. And they're teams that were full of 18-year-old kids. This isn't. This is 10 players who played in the Premiership in that 2017 side against Richmond. They shouldn't be serving this up, yet they are. So the average age from these two teams, actually spot on. 25.4 years of age for North Melbourne. The same for the Crows, who are supposed to be rebuilding. So Matthew Nix would would, uh, be devastated by that performance. He certainly was a new low for the Crows. And this was the coach after the match actually apologising to fans. There'll be some sore boys, 
physically and mentally, as well as staff and coaches. You know, we're all really disappointed with what we put out there. There'll be some supporters that, you know, I'm sorry to our supporters for the performance we bought. It wasn't at the level. It was nowhere near the level. And, um, you know, we're playing AFL football. It's been a baptism of fire for Matthew Nix. Do you feel a little bit for him? I do, yeah. I, I completely feel for him because I thought he was the right man for the job. I dealt with him at Port Adelaide. He went to GWS and he was clearly the best prepared to take them uh, over as coach, but he needs support around him. He's spoken about that. He needs a senior assistant coach. He needs an experienced head of footy or an experienced CEO. So they may look to make some changes above Matthew Nix at the end of the year. Rob Chapman, the chairman, is going to leave. Question marks over the CEO, uh, Andrew Fagan's role as well. Matthew Nix needs a lot more support from that footy club than what he's currently got. Now, we can't talk about this game without mentioning Mad Jack Dorr. What a special moment today, 706 days after his fall back in 2018. Uh, this is just so inspirational. Story of the year, I think. That is summed it up beautifully. Like, you just what a, uh, what a player and what a, um, a story it is, the story of the year, as I said. But not only that, uh, we weren't probably expecting too much from him, but he played a vital role today for North Melbourne and handy to come in with no pressure on because you know the result's not going to be a problem from basically the first quarter. That moment there, it's about the most emotional moment that I've seen this year. Every one of his teammates running to congratulate him on that goal and then cheering him off. He spoke magnificently after the game. And also well done to the North Melbourne Footy Club for, for their support towards him. I doubt whether he could have been at a better footy club to go through this. So uh, it was something that put a smile on everyone's face today. Yeah, during a really dark 2020, it was certainly a feel-good moment. Now, the Saints, they've pushed their claim for a top four spot. They're inside the top four, in fact, in third position. They blitzed the Swans with a six-goal final term and they're playing such fast and exciting footy under Brett Ratton. They are, and it was it was a great game of footy. It's another really good, tough, in tight game of footy, and, and Sydney were solid. But they may have found another one. This is Nick Hine. He kicked three goals. He was a mature age recruit to the Saints in 2018. Only played the 11 games, but they've got genuine speed in their side now. When you add Hill, Jones to that side, Butler to the side, Hine uh, has come in and, and playing his role. There's some real excitement to go with the young players that they've got, like King and Gresham, and these guys that we know, Caulfield and. Hunter Clark. So they're building a really nice core group of players. They're coached exceptionally well by Brett Ratton, who is one of the coaches of the year and is clearly a much more rounded coach than, than when he first coached Carlton. So he's he's done a great job here, but they're playing good footy. And, and that guy I love too, Rowan Marshall, Ryder's right, been a strength for them. So they were tough, they were hard at it. They laid 70 odd tackles, 20 odd of those were inside 50 and it was a really solid performance. One incident that threatens to sour the Saints' win, though, involves defender Jake Carlisle and Swans co-captain Dane Rampey, who I can't believe he's actually played with a broken hand here. Not a good look for Carlisle. Is he in trouble? Yeah, he's in trouble. He's had one, he's had two, he's had three cracks at that hand. It's a week uh, that uh, since Rampey had that surgery on his hand and he's playing. So as you said, what, a, what an effort. But this was the sort of stuff that was happening 12 years ago and we sort of let it go. Not now. The AFL has really cracked down on this and that is a complete no-no. So I don't know what the rules say in terms of a sanction, but he'll certainly be uh, having a please explain this week and it's a, a pretty unforgettable moment for, uh, for Carlisle tonight. To Friday night football now and Brisbane completely outplayed Essendon to move their record to 7-2. and two. Lockie Neal was a star with 33 touches and two goals. But I want to talk about Noah Answorth because he was handed the job on that man there, the dangerous Anthony McDonald, Tip and Woody, and he executed perfectly. Yeah, and I think uh, Tip and Woody's really the only renowned goal kicker in that Bombers lineup, and And history would say when he doesn't fire, Essendon lose. Now, with no Stringer there, with no Danaher there, Teams would know that if you can shut him out of the game, you're pretty much going to win. So Answorth comes in, as you said, did a great job, kept him to seven disposals and they get the results. So Tipper's going to have to deal with this and deal with it better than he has done in the last 12 months because no doubt that attention is going to be coming.
Yeah, he had just one disposal at half time and they threw him into the middle to see what he could produce. But Noah Answorth, certainly a, a rising star in just his second year of AFL footy. So the Lions joining the power with seven wins for the season after Port Adelaide basically destroyed Melbourne on Thursday night. And Melbourne President Glenn Bartlett didn't hold back in an interview with the Herald Sun. His comments where the performance was insipid. He said they were soft as butter. He tr that they trashed the jumper. He's basically put everyone at the club on notice here. It doesn't get stronger than that. I can't remember the last time a president has been as strong as that. I think Koshi and uh, Jeff Kennett have, have said some comments and Tony Cochran in the past, but not like that. So that's putting the coach on, on notice. That's the way that I read it. And usually the coach is ultimately responsible for the performance. And it's been a couple of years now or a year and a half that they've been struggling five wins last year and struggling again this year, Simon Goodwin, after we thought they were showing some signs of improvement. So I'm not sure Simon Goodwin actually knows what the issues are at Melbourne, and that's the biggest concern. He does look confused in the coach's box. He seems confused when he's speaking to the media post-game. And um, I spoke to a couple of Port Adelaide people on the night, and, and the word that they used about Melbourne was lifeless. They said it was a lifeless side. There was no buzz. There was no direction. There was no voice coming from the interchange bench. So... They were really surprised about how poor Melbourne were on the night. They were expecting a lot more. Simon Goodwin still has a couple of years left to run on his current contract. Is he the right man, though, to take the Ds forward? I'm not sure, Nat. I'm starting to question it. Um, and for that reason, that he cannot get to the bottom of the issues and solve them. I mean, he, 12 months ago, he was talking about the same things that he's talking about right now. Uh, and clearly, it is to do with their connection from the midfield to the forward line. But this is a side that are expecting to challenge in themselves because you don't recruit the way that they've recruited in the last uh, two years and give up the draft picks they've given up if you don't think you are ready to win a premiership. They're clearly not. And the club um, just doesn't know exactly where they are at. So this is the best 22 that was on afl.com.au before the season started. Four players there omitted in the last few weeks, just missing from that side. They were actually all available against Port. So there's not really any excuses, is there? Because they have all the personnel there. None at all. It's not a North Melbourne, a Sydney, um, an Essendon situation, or even a Geelong who are dealing with significant injuries. Fremantle, you know, Walters and Fife, their best two players out. There's, there's no excuses there. Uh, Jetta, while he wasn't playing, I'm not sure. Tomlinson, four-year deal and can't get a game. So no excuses whatsoever. I think they're too similar in the midfield. They've got five or six midfielders that basically play the same role with the same attributes. And they were too tall for a wet night um, in Queensland to go in with three talls and a couple of medium-sized forwards was never, ever going to work. While Melbourne's skills were fairly deplorable, on the flip side, Port Adelaide, it was just seamless. And the delivery to the forwards, they certainly had a day out, including one who is uh, sparking a lot of interest in Mitch Georgiades. He is, yeah. Pick 18 in last year's draft. Didn't play at all in the lead up to that draft. And maybe that's why he slipped low. But they're, they're really wrapped to getting, you know, Farrell to Dersma, Georgiades we're seeing. I mean, Pe Pepper's still early 20s. He's going to kick it to Rosie who takes a mark in his second year of footy. So they have young players coming out there. Is Port Adelaide and, and seriously good young players mixed in with guys like Westhoff and Gray and Boak who are still playing some pretty good footy, particularly Travis Boak. Um, so they've been the most consistent side all year. They've basically been in top position all year. And with the Brisbane Lions, they're the team that haven't really had the fluctuations in form. And what a contested mark that was from George Yardy. So they found another one on a night when Charlie Dixon was didn't have an influence at all, didn't touch the ball in the second half. Charlie Dixon, so some positives out of that, certainly. Now, the pressure valve was released slightly for the Hawks. They're back on the winner's list after four straight losses in a row. And I think Alistair Clarkson and some of those senior performing uh, underperforming players who um, were certainly feeling the heat in the last couple of weeks, they're breathing a sigh of relief. Definitely, I think relief's the right word. And we were thinking how much uh, halfway through the first quarter. They came from five goals down. And it was the senior guys that got them back. Oh, I thought um, Isaac Smith was great. Gunston hit the scoreboard, as did Bruce. And Shields was good. Uh, Mitchell and O'Meara. These are all guys that are 26 through to 30 years of age. So I think it's a bit of wallpaper over the cracks for, for Hawthorne. And perhaps gives Clarko more um, motivation to top up again when I think they need to go backwards to go forward. But 
certainly on the night, they were great to get themselves back into the game. It was a brave performance. It was a proud performance. And doesn't Jarman Impey make a difference coming back into that side? Yeah, he's so dynamic and nice to see him playing up forward. It, it certainly, as you say, buys some of those senior players who've been under the pump some extra time to get their form sorted. But I think a lot of Hawks fans would like to see some of the younger brigade coming through the ranks like a Finn McGuinness, Emerson Jecker and a Dylan Moore. So we'll see what Clarko has up his sleeve in the coming weeks. As for the Blues, though, Kane... When a team gets a run on against them, they just don't know how to stop it. Is it up to the on-field leaders to actually do more? No, it has to be. And I think this year's difficult because usually you would train all this type of things. You would come up with different scenarios. You would slow the play down. You would kick mark, take some sting out of the game. You would set up differently at the centre bounce after a team gets a run on and go more defensive. But teams can't train this year, so it makes it so difficult for a younger side to do that. Now, this is what's holding Carlton back. Look at it. Almost in every game this year, they've conceded four or more consecutive goals. And that was the case again against Hawthorne. It's costing them dearly. So that's why I'm not a believer in Carlton, albeit I've been impressed by some of their form this year. They appear still to be 12 to 24 months away from really taking that next step. And that's winning finals. From Carlton's concessions to the Bulldogs' blowouts and after their 41-point loss to the Tigers, Luke Beveridge's men now have the highest average losing margin in the AFL. We've seen glimpses of their very best. They just can't produce it consistently. Yeah, they're, they're a tease, aren't they, the Western Bulldogs? They've sucked a couple of us in with the, some footy that they've played this year. But, yeah, once again, and this was the case last year where they lost to some really poor sides. They lost to Fremantle last year, Carlton a couple of times in Gold Coast. And that cost them a a serious final spot last year. I know they snuck in in the end, but it didn't have an influence. Um, And this is what's costing them again. So I'm not a believer in their forward line. I'm not sure how they can win with Bruce there, who's only had the one game where he's been influential. And right now they're relying on Mitch Wallace, who is my height. And he's not going to be a, a, a key target for them in that forward line. So issues in the front half of the dogs. Now, just two more games to go for the round and two more games until round 10 kicks off. Are you loving this festival of footy or are you getting fatigued? No, I'm loving it. (laughs) I just, we've seen some pretty uh, um, big blowouts. So I think that may be the case as teams try and deal with uh, four day breaks in the coming week or so. But tomorrow's games will be great. Gold Coast and GWS and Fremantle need a performance, uh, even though they've been struck down by injury. So I think next week's going to be really interesting. Fascinated by the Melbourne and Adelaide game. That will have a lot of uh, people talking about that one, particularly for the loser. Get the popcorn out for that game. Now, just before we go, we love a dummy spit here on the round so far. And we had to highlight this one. The milestone man, Mitch Robinson, in game 200. He just wanted a free kick to kick a goal. Come on. (laughs) Was he upset about the no free kick or the the knee in the head from the teammates coming over the back? So, yeah, no, it was a milestone game. Everyone's, you know, lauded the influence that he's had on that footy club and the way that he's spoken about he's he's turned his life around for the better. So, Lockie Neal said he's one of his favourite teammates he's ever played with. Praise doesn't come much higher than that and and rightly so. He's one of our favourites here at the round so far. Kane, thank you as always for joining us. And thank you for watching. We'll see you again next week.